Hi, my name is Jeff Person, and I'm a vertebrate paleontologist with the North Dakota Geological Survey. I studied geology at the University of North Dakota and followed up with a master's degree at the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology, where I studied mammalian carnivores. My name is Becky Barnes, and I am also a vertebrate paleontologist with the North Dakota Geological Survey. I act as our lab manager. I receive my bachelor's in biology from Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota, and my master's also in biology from the North Dakota State University in Fargo. I was not one of those people that knew I wanted to be a paleontologist from birth, <laughs> or even when I was a kid. I didn't realize what I wanted to do until I was about a senior in high school and did a, I don't know, I guess I would call it an internship here at the Heritage Center and I helped to put together the Highgate Mastodon that's currently on, a, on display right now. And it was during that time that I found I have a very deep love of animal paleontology and, and bones and what they look like and why they look the way they look. Um, so why does a femur look the way it is? Why are some long and big and some are very short and fragile? Or why does a humerus look that way? Uh, and this is uh, kind of took me on my path to eventually studying vertebrate paleontology and uh, what we call functional morphology, which is why animals look the way they look. I think what I like most about being a paleontologist is the variety. I get to work outside when it's nice. I get to work inside when it's not nice. I get to tap my puzzle building skills by reconstructing fossils. And sometimes I get to work as an artist, building exhibits or new models of creatures or paintings of, of prehistoric extinct beasties. I like a lot of different aspects of paleontology. And probably the thing I like the most is the fact that we get to be outside when it's really nice out. And then when the, wa when the weather is poor or it's rainy or it's snowing, we don't have to be outside. We get to do the other aspects of our job, which include research or putting together exhibits or any of those other plethora of other things that we get to do. So we kind of get the best of both worlds. Uh, outside when it's nice and when it's not, we don't have to be out there. We, we actually can't be out there because it's, it's detrimental for the fossils if we dig when the conditions are poor. So the winter time, we often take advantage of not being in the field simply because the weather is poor or there's snow on the ground. And that's when we do the research that we need to do or we start uncovering um, various aspects of exhibits that we have to do, or we visit different exhibits across the state. Uh, we do research. Uh, preparation is happening at that time. The collection management happens at that time. The curation. All of the things that don't revolve around field work happen in the winter time. We have a very small window to take care of our field work, and that's really what we focus on in the summertime, and then all the other aspects of our job get done in the wintertime. It's a little hard to look for fossils when there's a ton of snow on the ground, although there are paleontologists that do that, those that head out to Iceland, Greenland, Antarctica, etc. Uh, I'm not one of those though. But in wintertime, I spend most of my time working in the lab, putting together the fossils that we find in the summertime. Otherwise, I'll spend my time making more educational articles or outreach, videos, books, even coloring pages. In the field, Jeff and I use a lot of the same tools. Anything from small brushes or dental picks to trowels, hammers, shovels, uh, up to larger jackhammers and rock saws, just depending on, upon what the situation requires. Once we get back to the lab, however, then I get to play with all kinds of extra little tools. We have little tiny air-driven jackhammers called micro jacks. Or we can use micro blasters, which are kind of like sand blasters, but they shoot baking soda instead. And they're really good for cleaning up all of that detail work on those fossils. I can't necessarily speak with tremendous authority on this, but it's my understanding that the oldest animal that's still alive today um, is probably the horseshoe crab. Uh, they are very weird looking. If you've ever been to a, a beach, like an oceanic beach, not a lake beach, but an ocean beach, 
Sometimes these will wash up on the shore and they are just bizarre looking. However, I will say, because this is just kind of a cool fact that goes along with the same topic, is sharks have been on this planet for a long, long time. Sharks actually, the ancestry of sharks dates back before the ancestry of plants. So technically, sharks have been on this planet longer than trees have. That's kind of cool. So I get asked this question a lot, and I like to think that my answer stays the same every time, and I think it does. Um, way back when I was in graduate school, we were at a place called Fossil Lake, Oregon, and it was at that place that I found something that seemed very boring at the time, but it was the toe bone of a bison. And the reason it was so cool and so important is it was that exact bone that I found that opened up and told us exactly how old the site was. There are very few fossils that can actually, that we use to date sites, uh, especially mammalian fossils. And the bison that we found at that site was the key to unlocking that. It had never been found before at that site, even though it had been visited for probably decades. Nobody had ever found that before. So we didn't know exactly how old it was until we found, until I found that bison toe. So I think that's probably the coolest thing I've ever found. I think one of the coolest fossils that I ever ran across was an out of place bone. I had been working down on a site in South Dakota on, it's called a monospecific bone bed, meaning that there was one kind of creature inhabiting this big bone bed. It was all Edmontosaurus, the duckbill dinosaur. And there were hundreds, even thousands of these Edmontosaurus bones in the rock layers that we were working our way towards. And they had a pretty, pretty distinct horizon. We would get down to what we called the bottom, and that was it, there was nothing more. Well, one day we hit the bottom, and there was a little prong sticking up out of the dirt. And so we kept digging, 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 and it ended up being the lower jaw, the lower beak portion of a Triceratops. And it was pristine, it was beautiful, it was 100% complete, it had all the little, little blood vessel grooves and, and nerve holes, and it was just really, really cool for, you know, a gal whose favorite dinosaur happens to be Triceratops. The coolest place I've been to look for fossils was I had a very unique opportunity to travel to Australia to look for fossils. That was an incredible experience. We spent about 30 days in the outback camping uh, and looking for fossils during the day. It was an incredible experience and I would go back in a second. It was a lot of fun. Well, I want to visit Australia. That sounds amazing. Sadly, I haven't gotten to go too terribly far from home. So one of the coolest places I would say that I've gotten to work with fossils would be down in Wyoming. And we were lodged on the hillside, praying that the rocks weren't going to go come crashing down on our heads. But our campsite was actually the, the real plus. It was, it was the real fun part of, of this particular site. It was a little flat area with our fossil site on one side, and we had this crystal clear mountain stream running through uh, right next to camp. And it was cold, so cold. We were able to build a little rock cache within the stream itself in order to put our pop cans so that we, at the end of the field day when it's hot and we're dirty and sweaty and gross, we could head right down to this mountain stream and grab an ice cold soda. So I'm actually one of those stereotypical paleontologists that actually study dinosaurs. Uh, and I've been out on a number of digs and have found uh, parts and pieces from quite a few dinosaurs. So in alphabetical order, we have a Cararaptor, Allosaurus, Ankylosaurus, Camarasaurus, Dromaeosaurus, Edmontosaurus, Pachycephalosaurus, a new creature that fits in here that I can't talk about yet, Struthiomimus, Thessalosaurus, Triceratops, and of course, Tyrannosaurus. We use fossils in a variety of ways, and one of the things we use fossils for is to help us to put together the history of our planet. Fossils, often the small ones, can tell us about environment. Uh, so we can use fossils to help us put that together. For example, uh, a frog 
might be able to tell us that the environment was sometimes wet, sometimes dry, or a fish would tell us that it was always wet. Or you might find a horse telling it was probably a plains environment. So we can use the fossils that we find to put together environments. And that's one of the things we can do with fossils. As a dinosaur paleontologist, that does mean some of our creatures that we find are indeed big. The bad part about this is it does take up a lot of space in our storage room. So one of the largest creatures that I found was actually at that Wyoming site, the creature called Camarasaurus, which is a big long-necked dinosaur, lived during the Jurassic period, which was found in the Morrison Formation. I think, though, Jeff has found some pint-sized pieces. Thanks, Becky. So I'm going to talk about the smallest thing that I found. And believe it or not, the smallest fossils that we find can actually fit on the head of a pin. They're that small. Usually they're very small teeth from small rodents or maybe even um, moles or voles, if you've heard of those. I'm sure you have. Uh, the teeth can be very, very small. And so they can be sub-millimeter in size. Very, very small. In North Dakota, we're fortunate. We have fossils all over the state. Uh, it's kind of an exciting place to be, really. One of the places we can find them is in a place called the Little Badlands, which is southwest of Dickinson. Uh, there we have fossils from the White River group, and they're about 32 to 33 million years old. Every year, we take people from the public out on these digs with us, and that's one of the places we can go. Becky? North Dakota savanna. That's pretty dry. We're going to go on the opposite end of the spectrum with our Pembina fossil dig, where we actually work with sea monsters. This is up in the northeastern corner of the state and are some of the oldest surface rocks that we can find in North Dakota. Anything from mosasaur fish, sea turtles, to long-necked sea monsters. It's pretty cool. Thanks. Boy, sea monsters in North Dakota, can you imagine? So the next place we can find fossils is a place not too far from Medora, North Dakota, which is out in the western part of the state again. And there is just after the fossil, the dinosaurs, excuse me, the dinosaurs have gone extinct, and we're finding uh, a swamp-like environment. So anything you can imagine living in a swamp was living in western North Dakota at that time. Crocodiles, uh, the dominant predators are the big things that we find, but we find lots of fish, we find lots of turtles, anything you can imagine living in a swamp environment, maybe like in southern Louisiana or south Florida today, is what we were finding in western North Dakota at that time. Becky? Well, Medora is a really nice place to visit. Another couple of places that you can visit to find dinosaurs would be south of Bismarck Mandan or in the southwestern corner of the state down by Marmoth, Bowman, and Rain. Uh, these are the areas of, that you would find dinosaurs in North Dakota, such as T-Rex, Triceratops, Edmontosaurus, and all those various other creatures. And we have had and have dig sites in many of those locations. Everything we find is priceless. We're not in the business of selling fossils. That being said, people tend to put a price tag on just about anything. One of the interesting parts about paleontology is we don't know exactly always where to look for fossils. Sometimes in an established quarry we know to just keep digging into the wall, for example. But if we want to establish a new quarry or find a new quarry or uh, just find other small bits that aren't necessarily in a quarry, we don't always know exactly where to go. And so for that, what we do is we actually go out and just wander, for lack of a better term. Uh, we will go out in very specific places. It's, it's very refined wandering, if you will. But we look in rocks that have been known to produce fossils in the past, and we might just walk horizontal layers. So if you can think of a large hill that has different layers along it, we might have one person walk up along the top of the hill, and another person walk in the middle of the hill, and a third person walk down along the base. And we'll all kind of walk together along those outcrops constantly searching the ground for a little scrap of bone that might lead us into something bigger. Once we recover a fossil from the field and it's transported back to Bismarck in the Heritage Center where our fossil lab is located, 
Uh, it's my job and my crew of volunteers jobs to put those pieces back together again. Sometimes that may take a few minutes, depending on if there's just a couple of grains of sand or a little light dusting of dirt that needs to be taken care of. Or it might be a bigger project that could take months or even years to complete. Once we're done in the lab working with things, then I hand those fossils off to Jeff. Thanks. So after she's done with them, they come over to my area into the collections. Um, think of the collections like a very large fossil library. For all intents and purposes, that makes me a fossil librarian. They get organized in a very specific way uh, that makes for easy retrieval later, and they will sit in the cabinets that they get put in for years or maybe minutes um, until a researcher comes by or they get chosen for an exhibit or any number of different reasons that they might, that they might be used for. That's usually where they will end up for long term. The oldest fossil I found is actually kind of young. Uh, I haven't gone back really into deep time in paleontology. So the oldest, the farthest I've gone back is into the, what we call the early Cretaceous, about 125, 130 million years ago, into a time period called the Beremian. And that was in South Dakota in the, what's called the Lakota Formation. In the Lakota Formation, we were finding, uh, we were looking primarily for small mammalian fossils, but we found a variety of things. Uh, one of the big things that I found uh, was a turtle. Uh, it was probably about this big. And because there's very few fossils known from that formation and from that time, it likely is new. It's probably new to science and, and unknown. It hasn't, to my knowledge, it hasn't been named yet. Uh, so we're finding a variety of things. We're really targeting those mammals. So that's about as far back as I've gone. I haven't gone into the Jurassic or the Triassic, anything like that. As far as the actual oldest fossils I've found, uh, probably, again, that Wyoming site, the Morrison Formation, we were digging in rocks that were about 155 million years old, working with those long-necked Camarasaurs, uh, as well as an Allosaurus. A fossil without any information collected from it is just a glorified doorstop. So we have to make sure when we're digging up those fossils to take as many notes as possible. Each of us has a notebook with different information that we collect, and some of us may find different things to be most important. So what we do is we gather together everybody's notebooks to compare notes if we need to go back into the past to look something up. You may find something like this where we have the dates, and the weather, any kind of field number that's listed, photographs from what we found in the field, in a searchable method. And all of these books are property of the North Dakota Geological Survey, which means when I finally retire, these books stay here. And anybody who comes in after me can use all of the information that we collect in these to look up anything that they may need. The different kind of information that we may collect in the field could be anything from the weather to the rock layers that the fossils are found in, what fossils are found, if anything weird that sticks out. Weird things are really important because they stick out in your brain and it may help you jog your memory to, to remember something in the future. So anything that's pertinent, that may help you jog your memory, that's all very important information to write down. Because no matter how good your memory is, you will forget, and if something happens to you, then all of your information that's stuck in your brain, nobody else can access. So that's why we have to make sure to write it all down. So here I've got a fossil fish. You can see that. But how did it get in there? Last time I checked, fish don't swim in rock, right? So picture this. Get this fish swimming around and doing its fish thing in the river or wherever it is, and it dies. So we're going to go belly up. Sinks down to the bottom, and down on the bottom, it gets buried. Deeper and deeper and deeper, until it's buried so deeply that it actually completely compresses the fish, and it stays down there for thousands or millions of years, where the groundwater seeps through and turns all those bones into stone, mineral by mineral, piece by piece, bit by bit. That's how we get to a fossil. Eventually, it will all need to get uncovered and be found, uh, of course, for us to tell it was there. Um, but that's kind of the, the basic life cycle of, of uh, a fossil. 
trying to explain all of the different subgroups that are within paleontology is a little difficult. So what if we use something that may be a little bit more familiar to you, like the study of biology or the study of life? If you call somebody a biologist, then you are saying that they study life, pretty much anything. But if you call somebody an ichthyologist, then you're talking about who's somebody who studies fish. Or maybe you're talking about an entomologist, which is somebody who studies insects. Paleontology is kind of the same thing. We have a lot of different subdivisions. So if you are a paleoichthyologist, you study, you guessed it, prehistoric fish. And if you are a paleoentomologist, that's right, prehistoric insects. And that goes for paleobotanists. You could be a paleopathologist if you like injuries. So really saying vertebrate paleontologist is just another way of saying some kind of a paleontologist who studies something that has a backbone. The most complete fossil that I've ever found it was actually 100% complete. It was amazing from head to tail. The whole thing was there, not a bone was missing. It was fantastic. It was a fish. Well, come on, that's cheating. 100% for a fish? That, uh, I think that's cheating. Uh, the most complete skeleton I found, I would say, is one of two things. We found a bison skeleton up near Williston a couple of years ago, and we don't know exactly how complete it is yet, but it seems to be pretty complete. Otherwise, uh, there was a large swimming reptile called an elasmosaur that was found in Oklahoma that I helped to pull out of the ground. And the cool part of that about that was the neck vertebrae were all kind of just wound around each other, almost like a little uh, number six or number nine or something like that. And we'd find one, dig a little more, and the next one would be there, and the next one, and the next one. And we just kind of followed this whole thing around in a loop. It was really kind of... Um, it was incredible. It was, it was kind of a fun thing to do. That's probably the other most complete thing I found. My favorite fossil. Um, I don't know if I have one favorite, but there's a couple that stand out. Um, in the Brule Formation in southwest North Dakota in the Little Badlands, there was a rhinoceros skull that we pulled out of the ground that I personally have never pulled out a nicer skull in my life. It was almost entirely there. It was better that just that skull was probably 99% complete. There was no deformation. Uh, it was, it was, it looked like a modern cow skull. It, it was so perfect. It was just like you just, you know, pull, found it in, the, in a farmer's field uh, because the animal had just died. It was, it was, it was amazing. And not too far from it were some vertebrae, some pieces of the backbone that were coming out of the hill. And they actually fooled quite a few of us. We came over and I thought they were, they were cow vertebrae right away at the beginning until you went up and just tapped them and realized immediately that they were rock and not modern bone. So I'd say that that's, those are some things that really stand out for some of my favorite finds. Picking your favorite fossil is tough but one of the few experiences that I've had where you actually get like the hair raising on the back of your neck and the goosebumps forming on your arms. Uh, I had one of those uh, happen down in Wyoming and we were working on a site and we had no idea what it was. We knew there were bones, we just didn't know what kind of bones they were. And digging, digging, digging all day long under the hot sun and we found these two weird little prongs sticking out of the, out of the ground and could not figure out what they were. So you know how you can just kind of take things and rotate them around in your brain a little bit? So I started looking at this thing and started rotating it. And all of a sudden, the goosebumps formed, the hair on the back of my neck went up, and I realized I was looking at the premaxilla of an Allosaurus. Like, no ifs, ands, or buts, that's what it was. And sure enough, that is what we found. Really cool. And this prong here, and this prong here, those teeth, were what were sticking out of the ground. So the Hell Creek Formation is just the name of a, a group of rocks uh, that were laid down at the same time as the dinosaurs were here, just at the very last gasp of the dinosaurs. And the Hell Creek Formation is essentially made up of all the sediment that was coming down from the brand new Rocky Mountains. So about 65 million years ago, the Rocky Mountains had just come up out of the ground. Okay, so they're brand new. 
Look at all this sediment coming down in rivers and streams and all of its depositing in western and central North Dakota in what we now call the Hell Creek Formation. And it's in that environment that the dinosaurs are living. We've got this kind of swampy sometimes, sometimes up on a little bit of land environment, not too dissimilar from the Mississippi Delta that you find in southern Louisiana right now. North Dakota is in kind of a unique place in that um, today, in modern times, we have um, a, a rural setting, so we don't have a lot of heavily densely populated spots, which leaves a lot of open area. It's those open areas, of course, that we're going to find the fossils in. The other aspect of that is uh, because of the glaciation we've had and because of certain types of erosion that we've had across the state, we have different age uh, ages exposed at the surface, which makes it great for a good variety of things coming up at the surface. Um, past environments also come into play for that. So, um, for example, the dinosaurs were living kind of in a swampy environment, and we, ha we had that swampy environment where other states did not have that swampy environment. So it's a lot of different aspects, uh, past environments, current environments, and our erosional history that kind of all come together and make North Dakota the place it is for finding fossils. Not everything in this world really has the parts to make a good fossil. You can get some amazing things, uh, unique pieces found, but the most easy things to become a fossil are hard parts, or things that have hard parts. So in us, that would be our bones or our teeth, or if you're a snail, that would mean your shell. Maybe if you're a coral, that would mean your skeleton. So depending on what types of hard parts you have, those are going to be your most common fossils. There are some very unique pieces, though, that are not necessarily hard parts. Plants, leaves are very prolific fossils. Ferns, very soft plants, can become fossils, along with jellyfish even, can become fossils in the right conditions. Many people who come in ask us, can I go look for fossils? And the short answer is yes. So you can go, but you have to be careful. So how do you do it legally? Or make sure you don't get in trouble. Two things. Make sure you have the landowner's permission. Or come out with us on one of our public fossil digs. We hold them every summer and public are welcome to come out. Check our social media pages for how to sign up and when sign up happens. And we hope to see you next summer.